Hi, I'm Tanya. I'm an engineering geologist working with Snowy Hydro on a Snowy 2.0 project. And I'm Cara. I'm a geotechnical engineer also working on Snowy 2 with Snowy Hydro. Today, we're going to talk about how Snowy 2 unearthed an ancient mystery. Snowy 2.0 is the latest addition to the Snowy scheme in the heart of the Snowy Mountains in New South Wales that connects Tantangra and Talbingo Dams. We're building this tunnel to channel water between these two reservoirs and it's going to travel through 27 kilometres of tunnel through this power station that is 750 metres deep underground. We use tunnel boring machines for this. This one, named Florence, was tunnelling through rocks made from volcanoes to create a tunnel to move water. You can see it's a really big tunnel. Look at the size of this machine. That's 11 metres in diameter and the tunnel goes for 16 kilometres. That's a really big and really long tunnel. So of course we did our research before we started tunnelling. We expected to be tunnelling through rocks that look like this, that are made out of volcanoes. These sorts of volcanic rocks are really strong and they're really hard and they don't dissolve very easily. So we told the engineers this to make sure that they designed the tunnel boring machine right so that it had the right cutters and that the support went in would be able to hold the tunnel up. Then, as we were tunneling, the volcanic rock changed. It started changing in colour and in strength and it looked more like this. It was a bit confusing, but it was still volcanic rock. So it was okay and we kept tunneling. And then we found things like this. You can see the two different coloured rocks here. You can see a bit of a shape to the bottom one, that's some limestone, and over the top is some volcanic rock. Take a look at these. Do you see this fossil here? Does that remind you of anything you've seen before? Oh, cool. That looks like something I've seen at the beach or while I was snorkeling. Spot on. Well, actually, it's the fossil of a coral reef. A fossil is any preservation of a once living thing. It could be bones in rocks, footprints, or a mold of a shell or animal. And in this case, it's the coral and other animals that lived there. Fossils tell us that this living thing was in this place in the past. This fossil, which we call limestone, is an entire ocean reef frozen in time. But we're not in the ocean, we're in the mountains. So where did we find this coral reef? So we looked extra closely at all of our excavations and we found it not only in the first tunnel, but also in a shaft nearby and in a slope as well. I have so many questions about this. How did we get a reef in our mountains? And why does it matter? Like, what does it mean for Snowy 2 and for the tunneling? So we're going to go through this step by step. And like scientists do, we're going to ask a few key questions to understand the problem at hand. How do you think a coral reef could be made into a rock? Since this type of rock was made from a fossilized coral reef, what properties do you think it would have? Pause this video and have a think. The history of a rock and how it was made can control the properties of that rock. There are three main different types of rocks. Igneous rocks are the ones that come from volcanoes, when the lava cools down either quickly on the surface or slowly as magma below the volcano. Sedimentary rocks are where small particles like sand, clay and silt, or even skeletons of little creatures are deposited in layers in rivers, oceans, or beaches. Over time, as everything builds up on top of them, they compress and turn into rocks like sandstone. Metamorphic rocks are where igneous and sedimentary rocks go through more processes with pressure or temperature and become something different again. Rocks hold all sorts of clues about their formation and origin. The two go hand in hand. If we know a lot about the properties of the rock, we can find out where it was made, what is it made of, and where can you find it now? Take a look at this limestone. With what you know now, what type of rock do you think this is? Igneous, sedimentary, or metamorphic? Have you changed your mind on how you think the rock was made? What do you think now? Let's pause here to have a think. Limestone forms in the ocean from the shells and skeletons of tiny sea creatures. When these creatures die, their shells sink to the sea floor. Over millions of years, they pile up and then get squashed into solid rock. The type of volcanic rock we had on this part of the project is called a rhyodacite. It forms when thick, sticky lava comes out of a volcano and then cools down. 
This is called an extrusive volcanic rock because it came out of the volcano. Limestone tells stories of ancient oceans, while rhyodacite is born from fiery volcanoes. The two ways these rocks were made controls the properties that they have. The properties they have can really impact what might happen if we try to build a tunnel through them. Have a look at this table that compares the two rock types. Which of these properties do you think might be important for a tunneler to know? Which property do you think will impact the tools you need to build the tunnel? Great. So we found out that we had limestone in our tunnel and we knew that if we didn't plan this ahead properly, we might have some problems. So we needed to understand if there was any more limestone coming up and how far it would go. And we needed to be able to give this information to our brilliant engineers and scientists so they could check that the tunnel would be okay and it would be stable and it would be able to proceed safely. A geologist is like a detective of the earth. We study rocks, soils and landforms to understand how the earth was formed and figure out what's happening underground. To figure out what's beneath the surface, we look for clues. We get those by looking at maps, aerial photographs, satellite images. We walk around and we drill holes to get core samples. So we put the clues together to create a model, a 3D map, and we compare that with the data that we've gathered from the drilling. And if the model doesn't match, then we change the model. Drilling is one of the most important ways that we can understand what's going on under the ground. And it means that we can check against what our old model was saying and we can update it to a new model if we have to. It's a mix of science, adventure and puzzle solving. Let's take a look at the way geologists do this. Let's do a practical activity so that we can understand how geologists find out what's underneath the surface. Before we'd started excavating, we actually did an awful lot of walking around and looking at maps and literature, and we'd even done quite a bit of drilling in that area. But we didn't find anything too surprising, just like maybe your initial coring strategy. Once we'd hit the limestone, we needed to do more investigating to find out exactly where it was and how far it extended. So we needed to know how big it was, if it was in little pieces or big pieces, and how much of it we were going to expect to find along the rest of our tunnel. So how did we find the answer to these questions? We did it the same way you guys did. We drilled a bunch of extra holes and we targeted places where we'd found some strange things. And we used that to refine our model and to change our understanding. And we also drilled a hole straight ahead of the tunnel boring machine so we could see what was coming up. We're at the core shed where we keep all of our core reference samples. We used a big drill rig to drill 860 meters below the ground and pull up samples in the correct order that they were deposited in. This is what we get out of it. This is pretty cool. This is 64 millimeter diameter core. And across the project, we did 42 kilometers worth of drilling. That's 42 kilometers of this. That's a lot of core. It's a lot of core. And a lot of that drilling was taken up in getting down to our very deep tunnels in the first place. And we were in a national park in a remote area with limited roads and limited access for drilling. So we had to be really careful about the spots that we chose our holes. And we knew that, uh, we knew roughly what ground conditions we were going to expect along the tunnel. And we designed a pretty fancy TBM and a pretty fancy lining system that can deal with pretty much anything we find under the tunnel. But what we geologists need to be able to tell the people building the tunnel is what they're gonna find ahead. So we always look ahead of our tunnel boring machine and we tell them what's coming up so that they know what type of mode they need to put the tunnel boring machine in and the way they need to drive it and which type of support they need to put in behind so the tunnel stays safe. How often have you lost something and you've thought, stop and think, where was the last place that I had this? And we can use some of the clues and some of the things we know about geology. We know kind of what environment the limestone might have formed in and we know where some of it is now so we can retrace the steps of this reef to try and understand where it would be a strategic place to target our drilling. Let's try and retrace the steps of this reef. If we can understand the history of the environment that it was made in, then we can try and understand a bit better where it might be. So we should probably go hunting for some more clues. 
What other clues can you remember from the rock that might help you narrow down the search? So when we first found limestone in our tunnel, we needed to take some samples and to do some tests to try and understand a bit more about it. So we looked at the context of where we found the limestone and the layers of the rock around it. We also looked at the limestone under a microscope looking for things like fossils. In geology, the type of rock is only part of the story. You need to look at the context of where you found it and the other things around it that can help give you some hints. Do we have any clues that we found? Well, remember it was sandwiched in volcanic rock? Surely that's a clue. It definitely is. But we needed to understand a little bit more about that sandwiching. So we ran something called isotope dating, where you try and check the different dates, the different ages of each of the two rocks. And we found out that they are 430 million years old and that they were the same age. And that's a big clue because that tells us that they must have been deposited at the same time. But how can you have a reef and a volcano in the same spot? That's a really good question. I think maybe we need to have a think about what we know about coral reefs. Do, what do we know about where they form? Are they normally in warm water or cold water? Are they normally in shallow water or are they in deep water? You might want to pause the video here and stop and have a think about it. Several theories were developed on how the coral reef formed. The scientific evidence only supported one, and that was that the coral reef formed on what was then a tropical climate on the Australian coast. Imagine we had a volcano in the ocean. The sides of that volcano would make a really nice shallow and warm spot for a reef to form. What sort of shape do you think the reef might make around the volcano? So, assuming that reefs 430 million years ago formed in the same way as reefs today, we can hypothesise about the shape of the reef that we're looking for. We looked for some examples of reefs around volcanoes in recent times, and we came up with this example from Bora Bora in Tahiti. So we joined the dots of the limestone occurrences and it made a banana shape. And that shape matches the typical arc-shaped coral reef formation. So we solved the puzzle. There was a coral reef really quietly forming around the sides of our volcano. And when that volcano went off, the lava came out and it spewed down the sides and it covered our coral reef and sides of the volcano blew up and it formed these giant bombs of rock and they fell down on the limestone as well. And so we ended up with a big mix of our coral reef and our volcanic rock. So now we understand the shape of the reef where the reef was originally and where the reef is now. Now we can retrace its steps to try and understand how the reef got to where it is. Do you have any ideas how the reef could have gotten where it is and how it could have traveled that far? The Earth's crust isn't one solid piece. It's broken up into big chunks called tectonic plates, like pieces of a giant jigsaw puzzle. These plates float on top of hot, soft rock deeper inside the Earth. They're always slowly moving Sometimes they crash together, pull apart, or slide past each other. This movement causes earthquakes, volcanoes, and even makes mountains grow over time. It's how the surface of the Earth is always changing. So way back millions and millions of years ago, the reef and the volcano it was sitting on got pushed between two tectonic plates that were crushed up together. The reef would have been pushed upwards and upwards and upwards until it was in the mountains. Almost everything we build in the world sits on the ground. We have roads, bridges, dams, tunnels, even your house. So we really need to understand before we build anything, what's going to happen when we put a load on the ground or when we tunnel through it. That's why it's really important for geologists to help us understand what the ground is and where it is, and for geotechnical engineers to help understand how you can deal with that safely. On a big project like Snowy 2, it's really important for us to understand what's under the ground before we start excavating. That's why we do things like build models like you guys did today, and to try and check them with new data coming through and validating that the assumptions that we made in our design are accurate. Engineers and geologists work together to do what you did today, which is understand what you think is in the ground and to make sure that that means that you can have a tunnel design that is strong and safe and built to last. So for all infrastructure, whether that's a bridge or a road or a tunnel, 
we use the same process. So the next time you're looking at any sort of engineering infrastructure, just think it's all about knowing what's beneath your feet and that's where everything starts.